All right, so you two both had questions about the limiting spectrum in particular. <laughs> uh, the first one is a little easier. The originals, more straightforward. Yeah, like the, that benzene ring really helps, right? When yeah. you can tie down, oh, I know six of my carbons and four of my hydrogens or whatever it is are, are on the benzene ring. You don't have nearly as much left over. It, yeah, it made it easier to kind of yeah, so, so there are a few things here, in here. One of the things that's tricky about NMR, and one of the things that we didn't really get into a lot of detail on yet, um, is the idea that, that you can get some peaks that are asymmetrical, especially if you have hindered rotation in some way. Uh, so sometimes if it's not free to rotate in both directions, whether that's because of a ring or more commonly because of pi bonds, that can actually give you a doublet where one side is noticeably higher than the other and you lose that. It's still kind of bell curve-ish. If it's bigger than a doublet, you can still see like, oh, it's definitely a triplet, but the right side is bigger than the left side skewed bell curve. And that happens a lot of times when you have hindered rotations. Um, and if, if you get really good at NMR, you can, or if you if you really dig into the textbook chapters, um, towards the end of the textbook chapter, it'll actually go into detail like, okay, well, if it's the trans isomer, you're more likely to see it shaped like this because here's what's happening with the spins and how they can align and how they interact with the pi bonds. Um, so if you can you can get a fair bit into that. That's also one of the reasons why the aromatic region is so messy because it's got a whole bunch of pi bonds and a ring structure, all of which sort of overlap with each other. And so so it gets really really tricky with that with those. Um, and so in particular for the the doublets here, sometimes if you can have. This is an example of what's called a, um, I mean, we, generally speaking, we could just call this a multiplet, but that's also like, it's a triplet of pentuplets. Yeah. Um, and again, with, the, with alkenes in particular, um, and on ring structures where it's locked into a specific configuration, you get those, those more complex interactions. Um, so what I would recommend for the limiting one and is, um, you know, one, this is still a, this is still one signal and you can still trust the integration when we're looking at, at these ones, the integration here is still is still good. The peak splitting gets messy, and we need to get dive deep into that chapter. Um, and there's more information there. Um, but we can still trust the integration. We can still trust the chemical shift. So then it's it's a matter of well, how much do we need the peak splitting? What is this really telling us? Maybe go read up on it on that a little bit. But at the very least. Um, from the formula in the IR, you should have be kind of limited. We know there's no benzene ring because there's nothing further downfield than five and a half. Right. So what can we do with that? And how does that all work? Might need to spend a little time looking at it. This is kind of a tricky one. And what if like 2.2, I was like, are those two like similarly de-shielded signals next to each other? Or are they a trip or a double it? Or so is it kind of asymmetrical, but like your some, to... Those ones I would say are two separate really? signals. Like okay. when you have that, that asymmetry, it's more it's usually, well, I guess it's similar shape to, the, to that one there. But if you look at the integration, that's pretty evenly split into. So I would look at that and say, oh, those are separate signals, each with a single proton. And with the integration, um, I was always like coming up like one short from the formula on hydrogens. Is there possible that the one in the farthest right has like a, it's like, there's like three groups 
together in there, maybe like a, a single well, word. Well, the integration should still work, even if all you do is look from, you know, if you can't tell where one peak ends or one signal ends and the other one starts, you can still integrate over the whole thing and it should still add up to the total amount, even if you're not sure if it's one signal or two signals. Yeah. The total should still be the same. Yeah. So, I couldn't get him to add up because I was getting like a lot of singles. I was thinking maybe because of residence, it was interfering with the integration. Um, I mean, that could be. Let, let me let's pull up the the other the other version here that I can zoom in a little bit more. So this one really doesn't have much detail. Everything's sort of overlapping on top of it. So right here, right? Um, but if we're looking at this one, this looks like it's one signal all by itself. It's the smallest integration. We call it that one. That's probably two. And then we've got a whole bunch on top of each other here. This is that peak at zero that I told you to watch out for. That's the tetramethyl silane. So ignore that one. So then it's just a matter of okay, if, if this is one, getting a get out of a ruler that actually looks like one, that looks like three to me. That looks like more than two, I would say. Um, does that match with what you thought on the other one? Uh, I had like some for this one and then two on the other one, and then I had like a bunch of ones in that like zoom yeah. region, which trying to like piece that together into a structure. Well, so what what does that tell you though? If you have a bunch of ones, yeah. you've got a bunch of of um, hydrogens that are all by themselves, right? Yeah. So that means that you've either got tertiary carbons, a lot of them, or you've got double bonds that are that are substituted, right? So that you can have just one hydrogen by itself. So let me go back to that. The other one, it's C better here. Yeah, from this one, it does look a little bit more clear that that's one and two, I would say. I agree. One and two, and that means this is also one. Yeah. So that tells you right there whether this is one signal or two signals, though, right? Yeah, it's kind of just the integration. Yeah, yeah, because you can't have integration of one split up over two signals. So that means we do have some splitting within splitting. We have something going on there. Um, so let me, I don't have slides prepared on the splitting within splitting. I'd forgotten that that was, this, that was as significant as it is to the limiting structure. Um, but based on what you had from just the IR and the formula, you're kind of limited as to what possibilities you have, right? What's the overall formula here? C10H16. So there's no oxygen. So, so no oxygen. So no weird function groups, right? Yeah. And did it have? So if it was saturated, if it was all sp3 carbons, no ring structures, what would the formula be? We haven't talked about degree of unsaturation as a as a tool for these yet. We've mentioned the term maybe a while ago. But if it's saturated, how many hydrogens are there for every carbon? Does anybody remember that rule? Eight times two plus two times three. It's, if it's saturated, it's um, for every n carbons, it's two n plus two hydrogens. And for every pair of hydrogens missing, that's either that's one pi bond or a ring structure. Right, because if you get that two n plus two on the two n plus two comes from those CH threes at each end of a chain, right? If you take both ends of the chain and you connect it, you've taken away those two 
So every um, every time you add an extra bond between carbons, it takes away a pair of hydrogens. So if it was saturated, it would be C10H22. So we're missing three pairs, right? So that means that we have three, three pi bonds, three rings, some combination thereof with only 10 carbons, you probably can't get three rings, right? That would be kind of tricky physically since we know that things don't like to form ring structures with less than five carbons. So, and if we looked at the IR, there was a whole bunch of, I don't like this, marker nearly as much as I like the one in the in PowerPoint. The whiteboard works a bit better. Uh, do we have any we have SP2 and SP3? Right. Yeah. Then the Edmonton shows is like two groups, like really far downfield, like vanillic, and then the rest are more saturated. Okay. So that's all good news because that allows us to to sort of start to apply some of this, right? If these two are the vanillic ones. Then we have potentially we have two. That tells us something here, right? That the integration coupled with the fact that it's vanillic tells us that one of these is going to be at the end of a carbon chain, right? We have a terminal alkene that ends in a CH2. That's probably what this is, right? And the other hydrogen attached there is right here. Oh, because it's vanillic, so it has to be on the opposite side of the vanillic molecule. Well, there is there has to be something there, right? But if it doesn't have a hydrogen on it, it wouldn't show if up. If it doesn't have a hydrogen on it, it wouldn't show up. So you could have a carbon there. So, but that's definitely one of our carbon carbon pi bonds, right? So probably we have something like a ring structure in two pi bonds, two, you know, two ring structures and one pi bond. How can we make that all work together, especially with this big mess? Yeah. It's it takes a little bit of practice, um, and like I said, I'll pull I'll pull some of the more important figures, splitting within splitting, to see if we can use that a little bit. But again, especially for this one, this is the eugenol is more what you're likely to get. This is a particularly tricky one because because they're all overlapping and there's no oxygens and there's no like smoking gun aromatic ring, right? And you should like look at each little peak and then draw like possible functional groups and have yeah. that sitting there and I can kind of like pick and choose and play with them put it together. This one I struggle you're, to figure it out. But you're close with this one, right? Especially with these ones down at the bottom. Yeah, the ones at either end make a lot of sense, but the middle ones are kind of hard to- Right. Measure. And you might not have any methyl groups. It doesn't look like there's a whole lot in the way of methyl groups because nothing really down here looks like you're going to have an integration of three, right? Or the, the, the full next second one is like an integration of six about. So is it? Put, yeah. Okay. Six, six, so you, I don't have the cooler with me right now, right? On that screen. It could be two methyl so it could, it could be two methyl groups. They're a little bit higher. Usually we see methyl groups below one. Okay. Right? Um, so things to consider, but definitely the, the fact that you've got those two vanilla ones and that there's a integration of two, the only way you can have an integration of two on a alkene is if it's at the end of the carbon chain, right? Because it has to not be attached to anything else. So some of it is just little bit tricks, like if you can rule things out or like use little logic statements, it must be this because that's the only way we could get this structure to look like that. So we'll keep working with this.
but I do still want to go over talk about competing mechanisms a little bit. Although everybody did did relatively well on the um on the quiz, we haven't. I've been kind of setting everything up to be talking about um, competing mechanisms because every time we talk about a mechanism, I, I keep you know giving you the caveat of now remember under certain conditions we can get it to go the other way, right? So I think we're already used to thinking in terms of competing mechanisms. Um, last question from the quiz though was for an elimination, why does the leaving group and your hydrogen, why do they have to be anti-periplanar? Um, and where periplanar was just that, that term that the mathematicians make the chemists use because it's not, it can be close to coplanar. It's not technically coplanar if you're a few degrees off. So we call it periplanar. It's not close to the, the same plane. Um, basically, because of the shapes of the orbitals, in order for one bond to break and the, another one to form at the same time, this is, this is especially true for second order eliminations. If it's first order elimination, that's not as important because you have the things happening in two different steps, right? But if it's going to be a second order reaction where everything's happening at once, so our sigma bond is not going to move. So if we have our leaving group here and we have our hydrogen here, if the leaving group is leaving and this hydrogen is being pulled off and both of those and these electrons here are then going to be turned into a pi bond, the electrons that are going to be turned into the pi bond need to be in the right physical space in order to be approximately where that pi bond is going to start forming. This bond starts forming an anti-bond when you start breaking these. So you wind up with something that looks like, like this, where one of them is shaded and the other one isn't. And the other side of that is gonna be on the other side here. And so you can start seeing this, these electrons can start donating electron density into that antibonding orbital as the bromine is leaving. And the shape of the antibonding orbital also starts to look like a pi bond at the same time. So because all of this were breaking bonds and forming bonds simultaneously, the orbitals need to be physically in the same locations, right? As this anti-bonding orbital is, is getting electron density moved into it, that starts breaking this bond and weakening this bond at the same time as you're starting to form this. And so you really have three half bonds simultaneously, three third bonds. They all need to add up to the same number of electrons when we're talking about how many electrons are what orbitals. We're still limited to, we have three pairs of electrons moving, but, Without drawing, trying to draw the shapes of the orbitals, you have the sigma bond that's not changing, pi bond that's forming, the sigma bond that's breaking, and the carbon hydrogen sigma bond that's breaking. All of that, you need electrons in all three of those orbitals sort of simultaneously in the transition state. And you can't do that if this hydrogen is 90 degrees. This hydrogen is 90 degrees, then the antibonding orbitals don't line up where, we, where the pi bond is supposed to be. You can't get those electrons moving from one orbital to another. Um, as much as we talk about how electrons don't obey the same physical laws as we're used to and how they can teleport from one energy state to another, they, in order to do that, they, they're still limited physically to being in the same spatial area. It can go from one trans or one energy level to another as long as it's already in the same space. It can't physically teleport or it can't spatially teleport. It kind of jumps from energy levels in the same area. 
and just steric, so sterics wise, we, the other possibility would be if the hydrogen was syn periplanar, if it was facing the same direction, that can still work, but the sterics are against it. Just because your leaving groups are typically big bulky groups and your base that's coming in to take the hydrogen is going to also have a negative charge or at least a partial negative and it's going to try to avoid the big electron groups of your leaving group. So that'd be like a Hoffman product that could happen in a little bit or? Um, probably immeasurably small amounts. So you, you, you won't get a measurable amount of that product just because there are too many factors working against it. Um, if you manage to have some sort of a base that had a positive charge or a very, very small base and also a very, very small leaving group, you could conceivably get some of that product, but it's gonna be very, very tiny to the point where this is one of the few places where we just say, you're not gonna see it. It's significant. Yeah, it's an insignificant amount. Does that answer your question a little bit, Alexian? Um, and I have the, if you go back when we first started looking at, at elimination reactions, I think there's a figure that has the orbitals drawn out better than I can do freehand. Um, if you check that out, I'll try and find it during our break here. And then, let's see. Question did I get to from, from last week's? Like we talked about both of your questions. You were both here. Lexi, do you remember what your question was from Thanksgiving break? Yeah. That was I, I know you were sick, so don't worry about it. Um, I was just I'll, I'll double check that. I just when I was going through these and for the questions, I was like, oh, I don't think I answered that one. Um, but then I forgot to copy and paste it. So all right. Um, so let's do some practice with elimination. Everybody, like I said, everybody did pretty well on the quiz, but just to get us back to thinking about the right frame of mind, what are the major and minor products of the following molecules were treated with a strong base? And if it doesn't specify sterically hindered, just assume it's, it's not ster a big bulky thing. So you can just look for your major products and be the Zeta product. Hydroxide. Yeah, hydroxide, amide, something like that.
right? So for A is another is one one of these ones where we do want to be paying attention to the whole anti-periplanar issue, right? So you draw the hydrogens out. If the chlorine that's leaving is sticking out towards us, the anti-periplanar position is going into the board away from us. Um, and if you wanted to redraw that so that they were both planar, so it's easier to visualize, not necessarily a bad idea. You just wind up with the chlorine down here. That. You just have to rotate this first one. out a little bit and then on the active carbon is the hydrogen we're not going to do anything with either of these i'm just showing that they're there and then if we took this one and we rotated it just a little bit so that we had a hydrogen 180 degrees from the chlorine and we're going to have And the second hydrogen into the board in the same direction as that propyl group. Doesn't really make it look, it, it looks a lot messier that way, but that is a way to see that the chlorine and the hydrogen are going to be 180 degrees from each other. And when they both leave, your new pi bond is effectively just going to flatten these things out. They're going to go from being tetrahedral to being trigonal planar, right? So we're going to wind up with something that looks like, as it's drawn, when we flatten this out, actually drew, yeah, no, that works. We're going to wind up with these two possibilities, right? We have two possible positions for the hydrogen to be in, right? Because we have two hydrogens we can take off of the alpha carbon. So one of which, the way it's drawn here, we're going to wind up with, I think this one's actually going to give us the trans or the cis product. Because if you picture these leaving and everything else sort of flattening out, this structure flattening out, you had the t-butyl groups coming out towards us and the propyl group, group both coming out towards us. So this one, when you take away this hydrogen here, what's left is the t-butyl group in the cis position to the probe. It's a little bit harder to visualize that here, the way, the way it's drawn here, um, because your leaving group is leaving towards us and away from us. But either way, we're going to wind up with the cis and the trans. And this one, when these leave, we'll get the trans isomer. Right, so our second possibility that's kind of sloppy because I was looking at a and a funny angle, but that's, that's the propyl group. Here's our t-butyl group. But this D2 can only take the anti- very planar hydrogen. How is it giving you cis and tran? You can only take the one hydrogen because there are two hydrogens there. So to get to the other, the other one, if we took this and we rotated it so that the hydrogen that's currently drawn coming towards us is away from us, that puts this group up here. Oh, because that part can rotate. Right. So, so we can pick one. either of these two. As it's drawn, we will only get the trans or the cis isomer, but we have another hydrogen to pick from that could also give us the cis isomer. And if that's the case, we look at with where are the sterics. The sterics are going to be are going to favor the yeah the trans. Product because we have two big bulky groups are going to try and be as far apart as, as they can from 
each other. So, you, so the way it's drawn, it it actually like is rotating in real life, and sometimes it's right. more cis looking. Exactly. And if it takes it in, when it's in that state, then you get the minor product. Exactly. So if we if we try drawing this as a Newman projection, it almost is easier to see. Yeah. Um, so for our front, for our carbon in the front, so if we're looking this way, down into the right is the chlorine, down into the left is the hydrogen on the active carbon, and then the T-butyl group is up. And then on the back carbon, on, on the alpha carbon, straight down is the propyl group. And then up into the left is the hydrogen, and up into the right is the hydrogen. So as it's drawn here, when we take these apart, we'll get the trans isomer. Mm -hmm. Because you're going to wind up with the hydrogen, the hydrogens being opposite each other, the propyl group and the tbuyl group being opposite from each other. But if we took this and we rotated that back carbon, so that this hydrogen was in the anti-periplanar position. Now this of the propyls over here. So T-butyl didn't move, chlorine didn't move, hydrogen didn't move, propyls over here now. There's our anti-periplanar hydrogen and the other hydrogen is straight down. Okay. Now, and that will be the same product, but the six is isomer. So I did have it wrong the first time. I was when I redrew it, I was trying to make it work better. And I I couldn't even visualize it properly. It takes some time to get the right stereoisomers. Um from, from these, you have to draw them as the Newman projection because then it's a lot easier to see what's going to happen when you take away those those anti-periplanar. Yeah. So yeah. Um, and in general, the sterics here that are favored here are going to give you the one that you would expect just from drawing the structures. In this case, the T-butyl group being anti to the propyl group is the one that's going to give you the trans isomer. And we would expect the trans isomer to be more stable as well, right? Because we have our two big bulky groups then opposite each other. So both the transition state and your final product, both are going to have less sterics. So they're both going to favor from two points of view. That's the major product because the uh, initial molecules like in that state more often. Exactly, because this is more common right. than this. If you will go back to when we first learned our Newman diagrams, right? We said, oh, most of the time it's going to be in the most stable state, right? This is really unstable because of the two big groups here, the propyl group is gouged to both of them. So this is a very, un not very unstable, it's much less stable conformer. So we're much more likely to have it here. And if it's here, it gives us the trans when it goes through the reaction. Good. If you only have one hydrogen on an alpha carbon, you're only going to get one product. So B is only going to have one product because there is only one hydrogen. And so to know whether you're going to get the cis or the trans product, do your Newman diagram, draw it the way that it's shown right now, and then put it into the position where the hydrogen is anti to the leaving group. So as it's drawn now, this example, this is almost the same molecule, right? So if we are looking the same direction, I'm going to take this molecule. Basically, what's different is up into the left is a methyl group instead of up into the left being a hydrogen, right? So then we can't have an elimination happen here. 
as it's currently drawn, we don't get elimination for B. We have to put that hydrogen in the right spot. So if we do rotate the hydrogen so that it's in the right position so that everything is in one big straight line there, Then to do that, we put the methyl group down and the propyl group is now up into the right. So when these leave and everything flattens out, you're going to get the propyl group and the T-butyl group on the same side. And on the other one, you're going to have the second or the hydrogen on the active carbon and the methyl group from the alpha carbon directly next to each other. So we'd wind up making the putting the two biggest groups cis relative to each other. Which would be the Z product, right? Or the cis product, either way. And in this case, it's that's the only product. So we don't need to worry about major or minor. There is only one alpha hydrogen molecule B, which means there's only one possible elimination product. This one? That's a one, two, three. Did I count wrong? Oh, sorry, it's an ethyl group, isn't it? Yeah, I did count wrong. So this should have been ETL on all of these as well. I was just counting all of them together, not realizing that I was double counting that carbon. It's easy to do, right? No, no, no. Thank you. Um, if it goes through, if you have a really good leaving group and you have a weak base, you're more likely to go through a first order elimination, right? There are a lot of factors that go into that, and we'll talk about it in more detail. But in general, if it's a weak base, you're not going to see E2 as much because you need something strong enough that it can come in here. It's basically the base that's driving the whole thing. The leaving group still has to leave, but the base is kind of pushing everything by, by pulling that hydrogen off. And as that's happening, this alpha carbon now has extra electron density, which can then work to kind of push the leaving group, give it a little nudge to leave the nest. If it's a weak base, that doesn't happen as much, right? If it's a weak base, the whole anti-periplanar thing doesn't matter because it's happening in two separate steps. Your leaving group leaves, which gives you an sp2 carbon with uh, or an sp2 carbocation, which is symmetrical above and below. It's already a trigonal planar, right? Because if it doesn't have a full valence, then you wind up with, with something that looks like just a completely unhybridized P orbital. And that, that now is attached to a carbon that has a hydrogen that has a good leaving group. Let's say it's the same molecule we're just dealing with.
it's already flattened out and it's symmetrical top and bottom. The carbocation is. So if the carbocation, if our leaving group leaves, all of a sudden it doesn't matter. We're still limited by where the hydrogens that can leave are. Like we still can't take that hydrogen off that's not there from a quaternary carbon, right? But it doesn't really matter which one of these it takes, they're going to be equivalent. There's not even really going to be a major versus a minor. I guess there will be to some extent because it's still going to try and minimize stereos. Um, but it doesn't have to be anti periplanar because it's happening in two steps. The molecule can twist, right? The molecule after can twist the after the leaving group yeah. leaves. Exactly. You're still going to have the, the hydrogen that leaves. When it leaves, is going to have to be coplanar with this pi bond or this empty p orbital in order to make the pi bond. But because it's symmetrical top and bottom, it doesn't have to be anti anything. There is no anti to this one now, right? So it doesn't matter. Even if we took this and made this the CH3 again, still is not really going to affect. We're still going to be able to get both possible. Uh, are we going to be able to get both possible products? Yeah, because it's symmetrical. Because it's symmetrical top and bottom, so this hydrogen that can leave can leave from being straight down into the right or up into the right. Which means you're going to get two products that are 180 degrees from each other. All right. So out of our four mechanisms that we're dealing with, they all have sort of their own idiosyncrasies, but at the same time, there's a lot of similarities to how they work, right? Especially it's the first order reactions that you have to worry about rearrangements. It's the second order rearrange or um, second order reactions where everything's happening all at once, where you have to worry about being um, anti periplanar The one thing, the one thing that I do recall, at least it's one person missed. If we had this, I'm going to go back to the whiting out the screen and redraw that intermediate we just had. And yeah, it's CH3 and then hydrogen. Yeah. If it goes to the first order reaction, what's the other thing we have to keep in mind? The uh, rearrangement from the hydrogen. The arrangement from the hydrogen. Rather than having it leave, it can actually rearrange because now that can give us a tertiary carbocation, which is much more stable, right? So our rearrangement then gives us this intermediate. And now we have what the choice is for alpha hydrogens. So if the conditions are right to make like a more substituted or a, a carbocation and that's like more substituted, is it always going to happen in the rearrangement then generally? Pretty much. If if the only rearrangement that can happen is a methyl group shifting over instead of a hydrogen, that's slower because the methyl group is just physically larger. And so in that case, you might not see it. But in that case, you also don't have an alpha hydrogen necessarily. Um, so it's, I guess, let's say if it was, if this wasn't just the hydrogen one, then there's no push here to move a hydrogen over because then it would still be secondary, right? But then it's, well, let's work through this one and then we'll talk about that case. 
So then in here, all of a sudden, we wind up with four possible products, right? Because any of these four hydrogens can be pulled off and they're all going to give us slightly different products, right? We're gonna have a cis and a trans, we're putting the pi bond here, and then a cis and a trans putting the pi bond here. So we put the pi bond here, there's that product, and then there's the opposite stereoisomer. No, I'm sorry, I did that wrong. We have that stereoise or that molecule as well, and then the cis trans version of it. That's the cis one on the top. That would be actually this would be the trans because the the higher priority would be the ethyl yeah. and the T butyl. Right, so we have the other molecule. See. Or the intermediate rather. Now there are yeah, there's two hydrogens here that could migrate over to do a rearrangement, but there's no reason to, because we go from being a secondary carbocation to a secondary carbocation, right? So we don't gain anything by doing that. It's only going to rearrange if you gain something in terms of stability, going from a secondary carbocation to, to a tertiary, um, being able to have resonance. Like for instance, if this was, if there was already a pi bond there, now, all of a sudden, moving one of these puts the positive charge where it can resonate back and forth, and that would be more stable, yeah. right? But there has to be something that you gain, that your molecule gains in terms of stability in order for it to, to really have a push where it's rearranging. So neither of these hydrogens gives it us anything. But if one of these methyls could move over, we didn't see that on the last one because we had we had two ways we could make a tertiary carbo carbocation, right? We could move a hydrogen up on the last one to get a tertiary carbocation, or we could move a whole methyl group to get a tertiary carbocation. It's not going to move it. It's going to be much faster to move a hydrogen because it's so much smaller. So you're not going to see a noticeable amount of the methyl migration. Methyl migration, that's what they actually call that. That's the term. It's a methyl migration. It sounds like a, a biology term. Um, but yeah, you're not going to see that happen when you could just move a hydrogen instead to get the same benefit, right? It's, you know, if you could, um, you know, drive two minutes from your apartment to go get a Domino's pizza, you're not going to drive down to Carson City to get a Domino's pizza. So, but if there's no other option, we can see that, in which case we would wind up with this is our intermediate all of a sudden. That would be more stable too, like two tertiary carbons. Well, a tertiary carbon is not in itself more stable, but a tertiary carbon cation is. Oh, yeah. So it's the fact, it's not that we get two tertiary carbons out of it, it's that our carbon cation went from being secondary to tertiary. Yeah. And now we only get one, I guess we technically get two products because we could. Put the pi bond here, but there is no cis trans for that one, right?
gnosis and trans here because if you switch these two, they're identical. So there's no difference between the two possibilities. So that would be our zinc sub product. Then we could also have the Hoffman product. Is there a system trans for the Hoffman product? Five bonds on the end. So. Yeah, high bonds on the end. So two hydrogens, right? Anytime you've got two things that are identical on the same carbon and alkene, there's not going to be a system trans. Right? Because switching the two hydrogens doesn't give you anything different. They're identical to each other. So same logic is why there's no system trans here. All right, how we feel about eliminations now? <laughs> There's still a lot. Yeah. And you have a total of four mechanisms, but only four mechanisms for, for the entire second half of this class. That's not so bad, right? And they're all related. They all have their own idiosyncrasies, but they're all related. All of the like, steps make sense. It's just like linking them together. That's it is, and so I, I would highly encourage you to to break it up into, you know, maybe it might be helpful for you to write yourself out a flowchart. Like, here's how I decide what mechanism it is. Once I decide what mechanism it is, here's what I need to worry about. For the SN1 and E1, I need to think about rearrangements and what that does. For E2, I need to think about that whole anti periplanar thing. For SN2, I need to think about is there room for my base to get in and actually to, um, get to that active carbon? You know, just if you just have a list, okay, for the, this is what mechanism I'm choosing, here are the things I need to consider. And just sort of give yourself a checklist for each of the four. And there's going to be some overlap, right? Rearrangements happen in two of them. Um, and really, that's the most, the trickiest thing about these carbocation intermediates is that you have to think about rearrangements. Other than that, they're actually almost a simpler mechanism because it's happening in two steps. Well, let's take a break. Let's come back at one, at one after, at five after, when the big hand's on the one. <laughs> <laughs> How are you feeling? Um, a lot better. Uh, last week was just like. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, it feels like it's the worst possible time. Yeah. It's like with the Yeah. <laughs> this week was the worst to... possible time. So. Yeah, that's true. Actually. <laughs> Both for seconds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, glad you're back though. It's like, oh, man, it's just me and Nikki now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, it was pretty good. We did what we tried to do the CO2 and it just uh, neither of us could get it to work. You need to get a lot of pressure to make it liquid. And then the caps like leak and the, it's if you like tighten them too tight, they leak and you don't get them tight enough. Leak, so I don't know. So yeah. it's bombs. They really put that to work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, I'm like, you guys did it. We don't want to do it. Right. Yeah. Give it a shot. <laughs> yeah, right. I was writing the lab last night for that. I'm just like, oh, this sounds terrible. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then, yeah, then we just did. Um, so you were here when we did lemon before, right? Yeah. I think we like. Uh, oh, yeah, so we, oh, then we just finished that. We put it in the funnel and then yeah. rinsed it with like the chloral methane, and then um, and then we just kind of like distilled the methane and went into. Um, Which did you get from yours? I still have like I'm still writing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So that's the 
<laughs> yeah, write up some bullshit. <laughs> uh, did Zeke inspire my like Lemon Sample Act? He's been MIA. Oh, yeah. Since like you were here last, you were probably here last with Zeke twice. It's been like two weeks now, right? Yeah. Because I feel like when you were here last, he still wasn't. Like, he wasn't here before Thanksgiving break, was he? I feel like he was gone the week before. It might have, he might have been, yeah. I think he's gone the week of. Yeah. I think that was like, yeah, we haven't seen him since then, yeah. 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 I heard people out that he hasn't been in there either, so he kind of just dipped out of school, I think, this last year. Yeah. Who's watching this video now? Watch the videos and then you hear yourself talking for it. You're like, yeah. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Well, I, think it's... I mean, I can give you mine. Yeah. Since we both did live. I don't think just like write the procedure, you know, like you still did at least like half of that one, you know. Yeah. Um, and then you could just be like, yeah, write the procedure. Like, this is what I would have did, put it in the funnel, you know, this is what I would have expected to get, and I would have measured it this way. Yeah. Yeah. That's basically what we're doing for CO2 anyways. Yeah. We're we're doing doing this. Anyways. <laughs> and that's what they did during like pandemic, you know, when they couldn't actually go in the lab. They're like, oh, you just have to add this together and you mix it, and then you should get this, you know. So it's yeah. pandemic rules, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, I'm sure you can get some credit. I was like stressing last night. I'm like, man, we have this big final project and we have our final. But then I like looked up like how much percentage of the grade is, and it's not like that bad. You know? For the lab final? Um, yeah, so the test is like 15. The final test is 15% of the grade. The lab final is like 10% of the grade. So like it's a big quarter of the grade resting on this week. <laughs> I thought it was like half, so it's, it's like better than that. Yeah. Put more weight on assignments and stuff. This week. I think it's our lab final. It's, it's, it's the same thing again. So we're doing, but it's an unknown. But we have to do the and yeah. <laughs> it's okay. It's fine. It's okay. We just do the same thing, crush it up, put it in the installation. Um, and, then, and then we're just going to have, it's going to be the same thing. I think that we just have different charts pretty much. And then we'll like, analyze the IR. Did you look at the IR and the MR? Like, yeah. Cool, yeah, I grew up on that. It would actually be like shell shock. Keep yourself from looking at the structure, but yeah, that's <laughs> graphs and then like just come up with the structure. And then, like, I was really struggling with living on one. I like looked up on one, and it's like 20,000 possibilities. <laughs> it's so hard. Just need to practice to build up to that. That's the one thing about this. I don't like the quarter system. I wish this, I wish the time between the beginning of the class and the final was like longer, like the semesters, you know, it's just like like if you get sick for a week, it gives you more time to catch up. Yeah. yeah, like it's it's all like coming together, but it just I, I'm like I was stressed last night. Like it's just not coming together fast enough. <laughs> like, so that exam and calc yesterday. Yeah. Most of the material was on the exam. Usually we get like a quiz or two, mm -hmm. um, which is like kind of a good idea. Practice it. Yeah. But with this one, like, because it's the first system, it's probably condensed right now. Yeah. Yeah. You haven't had any quizzes on it, and I was like sick for the majority oh, of the yeah. lectures. So it's like, yeah. I think this makes sense, but I don't. I don't know. Well, we have physics right after that class, and a lot of people already got, they came in just like, yeah. <laughs> like yesterday, just like, God damn. It seemed like, yeah. <laughs> Like it sounds like that class has been rough. We have it in the morning, it's the 30s. Oh, not the 30s, just the one. Oh, you're having yeah. something? Yeah. Oh. It's a, it's the multivariable. Oh, you're second year, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 That's probably way worse. <laughs> <laughs> I know, remember the first year, it's like, oh, God. 
So the culture for it's necessarily like I have a worse time than like this kind of this. So this one it's like all the same things, it's just kind of like expanding into three dimensions. Okay. And like applying it to to more things. And then you like start to see like, oh, like we've been doing this all the time, just in a very specific case. Mm -hmm. kind of like, like it. reinforces what you've already yeah. experienced. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not like the first thing, it's just yeah. uh, This is Nick Murray now. See about that. Make sure that this textbook does go in. I haven't fully reviewed the NMR chapter. I can't imagine a full length um, OCHEM textbook doesn't have doublets of doublets covered. But then again, maybe, because this is a first year OCHEM class. For yeah. our final, do we for our last final? Do we get like a week, like turn it in on Tuesday, or do we finish it all today? So you'll get a whole week, yeah. and basically any time that the lab is not in use between now and next Thursday is fair game. You can come in to work on it. So uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more in in lab today. But yeah, you have you have the whole next week and a half to write up the procedure and it's you're not starting from scratch right it's still doing a steam distillation or a co2 extraction of an essential oil you're just writing it up yourself thanks how are you i'm looking for soup glass i thought she told me this is where she was across the way sorry but you... the, the room formerly known as a208 <laughs> Let's see. Still just in plus one little has a coupling constant in here. Let's see. At the group, I suppose the group. So there's your doublets of doublets. So that's going to be tied to that's this section here. So we have a coupling constant. Um, H and A are coupled to each other. So if you have, if they're coupled, if they're directly, if signals are directly next to each other, this is not exactly what we're talking about, this is also useful. If this, the distance between the peaks in the peak splitting, if that's the same, then that means that those two signals are likely right next to each other, or if they are adjacent to each other. So that's what this one is. Is showing here. This is fine. This is the wrong textbook. That's why it has that. Why did I grab the wrong textbook? Murray. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll find that figure um, and we'll go over that. I'm kind of going through. Yeah, it's here right now.
Um, but I will pull up that other. That other um, PowerPoint where we we're looking at elimination mechanisms. So this would have been, so this is lecture 16. No, I guess it does. This one doesn't have the, the or that must be my pen still can look. Um, but it does have the slides on on how that all works and how they determine that. So anyway, so here's our review of all four of our major mechanisms that we're looking at right now. And this is oversimplified in some respects, but there are some um, big big picture not just a generalization, kind of hard rules. For one, if it's a methyl, if your leaving group is on a, on a primary carbon or a methyl carbon, you will never get um, a first order reaction because you will never make a carbocation intermediate. So right off the bat, if it's a primary alkyl halide, or um, you are only looking at the second order reactions. If it's tertiary, you're only looking at you're only looking at the first order reactions. I guess the difference if it's a tertiary alkyl halide, you can still get the elimination. You can still get E two because you just need to be act, have access to an adjacent carbon to the alpha carbon, not to the active carbon. All right, so the, when it's primary or tertiary, that simplifies things. If it's a strong base versus a weak base versus a strong nucleophile or a weak nucleophile, that simplifies things too. Right. And so, and again, there's a couple different sort of study guides and cheat sheets um, that you can use here. This one was from the Klein textbook that we taught last year, but there's a similar one in McMurray as well. I like this one because uh, color coding and the fact that they split it up into two colors um, really makes, makes the point. Um, that I want to see here. And this table is fairly important too. Is it a strong base or a weak base? Is it a strong nucleophile or a weak nucleophile? Every nucleophile can also be a base, but just because it's a strong nucleophile doesn't mean it's a strong base. Just because it's a strong base doesn't mean it's a strong nucleophile. If it's a strong base and a weak nucleophile, that's generally because it's sterically hindered. The sterically hindered strong bases can't get into the active carbon. And so you're typically only going to, if it's a strong base in a weak nucleophile, you're only going to see elimination happening. If it's a strong base and a strong nucleophile, that's when we get mixtures of the two concerted reactions unless it's tertiary, in which case it's just E2. If it's a weak base, you don't see any elimination to speak of. If it's a weak base, it's not strong enough to pull off that hydrogen, but it still might be a good nucleophile. Weak base, strong nucleophile are gonna be things that have a negative charge but are the conjugate base of a strong acid. So things like iodide, bromide, chloride. They're decent nucleophiles, but they're really bad at being a base. And the weak base and weak nucleophiles are going to mostly be your solvent molecules, and they tend to be neutral. Right. And this is the part that I don't like about this chart is 
it says that you're not going to see anything with a weak base, weak nucleophile, unless it's tertiary, in which case you're going to get a 50 50 mixture between SM1 and E1. That's not exactly true because that's this doesn't take into account solvent effects. And this doesn't take into account the account that we can make a leaving group a better leaving group. It doesn't. And it, it's a little bit oversimplified to say you're not going to see any of it. You're going to see some of it. It's just not going to be very fast. Um, and so that's why I like this figure instead. And I've thrown this one up before, but it'll make more sense now that we've covered all of these. Um, and this it's linked on the canvas shell as well. So you can you can get your own copy here. Principle. Sometimes where I really wish I lived in a larger city that had you know decent internet speeds and things like that. Internet was invented 200 miles away and it's still slow here. Exactly. It'd be nice to have fiber. Oh. I do. There. All right. So this one, I like this one. It's a little bit harder to, to parse. It's not color, so it's not as pleasing to the eye, but it has a lot more information on it. And so this one, and it has a limit uh, arranged instead of by strong base, strong nucleophile, it has a limit, uh, arranged by mechanism. So primary carbo or primary leaving group. Never SN1, never E1. But you can take SN2 if you have a strong nucleophile. You can have E2 happen if you have a strong bulky base or if you have a strong base plus heat. That's, that's one that we hadn't really talked about in much detail yet, but it was on the quiz a little bit. We mentioned it at the end of the class. Actually, it might have been back before Thanksgiving break at this point. How does heat affect elimination reactions? Or why does heat affect elimination reactions? Not quite. Activation energy doesn't really change a whole lot. But remember that every reaction. The equilibrium constant is governed by delta G, right? Delta G is what equals what? Who remembers this equation? Changing this times the T. What's delta S? Entropy, right? Disorder. So delta S at high temperatures. This term gets bigger. The other way of thinking about this, not don't think of it in terms of spontaneity. Um, it becomes spontaneous versus non-spontaneous. Um, it can be helpful to think about it in terms of which side is favored at equilibrium. I'm just going to go back to. I've been having time of it today. Um, if you think of it in terms of, okay, I have I have, say, one bromopropane and water as the base. Sorry. And actually, it's not going to wind. The water is not going to wind up better. So let me erase that. If 
this goes through an elimination reaction, the net reaction looks like this, right? Which side has more entropy? Product side, there's more pieces. There's more pieces, you can have more disorder. So that's the, the simplified way. If you have the reaction in mind and you're talking about changing the temperature, high temperatures always favor the side of the reaction that has more entropy. So the change in S is the same no matter what. Temperature changes makes this term bigger or smaller, but the net result is, uh, is at low temperatures, equilibrium moves to the side that has less entropy. At high temperatures, equilibrium moves to the side that has more entropy. So you can actually favor elimination reactions more by increasing the temperature because you are making use of this section of the delta G equation. And so that's why you see on a lot of these, it says a strong base plus heat or a strong bulky base. Strong bulky base is going to favor elimination over substitution because a strong bulky base can't be a good nucleophile. And, or if you have a strong base plus heat, a strong base, it's just hydroxide, that's a good nucleophile and a good base. But with heat, you're going to favor elimination over substitution because you get more pieces out of it. Right, and here's the section that has the, the notes for each of these. These mechanisms, SN1, SN2, watch for carbocations, or S, SN1, E1, SN2, inversion of stereochemistry that we had the umbrella flip, right? E2, your, your leaving group and your hydrogen have to be anti periplanar, which limits sometimes what um, stereoisomers you can get in your products. Right? If you know, if you know what everything on this page means, this is pretty much everything you need for the for the text, really. Because you still have to know what SN1, E1, SN2, E2, what that's going to do. But this has all of those wrinkles. How do I decide which mechanism do I go for? How do I, and what do I need to remember about them? Including, if it's E1, you get the Zetsev product. If it's E2, you get Zetsev if it's a small base, or you get the Hoffman product if it's a bulky base. Strong bases always go E2 over E1. And tons of information on this page here. This is a hugely valuable study tool. Is it on campus or? Um, I believe so. Yeah, I think it's in the in, where just did you find it? Um, or I have not, but I was just saying, like, is it just in the files? It's it's in the files. It's also linked under resources, I think. Um, but if you can't find it, let me know. Um, and I believe it's it's just got the same title. If you just if you can get to the files, if you search WBU, it's from somebody at Western Virginia University made this. We even have like um like in the midterm we have the practice midterm. Yes, I will give you our your final is supposed to be on Tuesday of next week. Then I owe you a practice test. Yeah, I'll have that for you um, by the end of lab today. And same deal, it'll be a, a homework assignment that you will just get points for turning it in. Um, and the structure of the test will look very similar, like I call it mine. Um, and we'll talk about Thursday is just review. Um, and if there are any significant slides in here that we don't get to today, there might be a little bit of, of finishing up. Um, but uh, yeah, so we'll, we can talk about the structure of the test and everything then as well. Uh, a note about next Tuesday. So I have 
I believe our final time slot is 10 to noon in the same room. Um, if you're, if you have testing accommodations, you want to set it up um, with the testing center with the SAS. Um, do so. Let me know when you're planning on taking the test so I can make sure they have a copy of it by then. Um, I might not be on campus next Tuesday because I have jury duty on next Tuesday and I've already postponed it once. So they won't let me postpone it again. <laughs> I gambled and like, oh, <laughs> usually if you postpone it, you don't get the call for the second one. And they like, immediately sent me the jury summons for that. <laughs> um, and it's on the first day of it is on Tuesday. So um, later this, actually I'm gonna, I'm gonna go from the day, I'll check to see if I actually have to Luckily, well, hopefully they'll dismiss it and have said, nah, you don't need to spread your brain. Right. Sure. Um, but uh, so, but if there is a worst case scenario, that is, I won't be on campus next Tuesday because I had jury duty. I mean, in which case, Mario Love will proctor the test um, and, you know, just make it, you know, if you have any questions that you normally would want to ask me for clarification on it, just write down, like, you know, I was able to ask you this question. And I'm assuming you meant this, or this is the assumption I'm making because I don't have you here to clarify. And as long as that's reasonable, then I can give you credit as long as you write down what your assumptions are. Um, and if it's something, if it's more complicated than that, it's probably something I was going to give you an answer anyway. So um, yeah, do your best um, and you, you'll be fine on that one. Just like the midterm, I don't think anybody had any questions for me on the midterm anyway, but I'm always worried about that because I don't want to put that on Mariola. Yeah, just trying to answer questions. All right. So the brute force approach to me writing questions for these is based is this. Drop all elimination and substitution products of this reaction. Period. So all your E1, all your E2, all your SN1, all your SN2. Watch out for rearrangements for some of them. There could be a whole bunch of possible possibilities here. Um, in fact, you might fill up an entire page just with products. You know, four possible mechanisms. If, it, if I make the, um, if I write the, the question properly, there's a lot of possible products you could get. Um, with that in mind, we're not going to spend time right now doing all of them. It's good practice for you at home. Let's just talk about what mechanism would be most likely based on what we've been talking about. We have hydroxide as our base in our nucleophile. Is that a strong base, strong nucleophile, weak base, weak nucleophile? Strong base and strong nucleophile, right? So if it's a strong base and strong nucleophile, we're looking, and it's a secondary carbon, we're looking at some mixture of SN2 and E2. The, the, this figure says that we would favor the elimination. I would say that's gonna depend on the temperature. If you did this at low temperature, you could get you could get the blue section here to get bigger, and you could get this purple section to get smaller. If you did a high temperature, the opposite's true. So, and if we looked at the other our other figure here, secondary favorite strong nucleophile, favorite strong base, favored L over SN two with heat. Right, so some combination. So let's let's treat it like they're going to be roughly 50-50 since it doesn't say anything about heat. Then we don't really have a way to distinguish which of them is going to be more likely. So just pick SN2 or, or E2 and start drawing what the products would be. If it goes SN2, We have that backside displacement.
which means we get that umbrella flip when it comes to the stereochemistry. Now we're really reaching back like a month at this point, but we spent some time with that. So SN2 in general will only ever give you one product. SN2 is there's a reason why we start with that as our as our first mechanism we study. No rearrangements. We're not making a new pi bond, so we don't care about the alpha carbons. It's just the active carbon, and the only thing you need to worry about is that umbrella flip. We are not even going to get more than one stereoisomer. We're only going to get one stereoisomer. And the easiest way to draw that is to, if your leaving group is sticking out of the board, your new, your new group, alcohol in this case, is going to be sticking into the board in the same spot. You could rearrange it and redraw it and make it different. That's the easiest way to do it. If it goes E2, we have two alpha carbons that have hydrogens on them, right? So our hydroxide is either going to come in here. Or here, and it does need to be anti periplanar if that makes a difference. Uh, and actually, let me further color code this. If it pulls the blue hydrogen off, are we going to get? Is there a system trans we need to worry about? It's two methyl groups. Yeah. So because these are both identical, we don't even need to worry about the anti periplanar thing because it doesn't matter which way we rotate this, put the hydrogen away from everything else, or um, 180 degrees from the bromide, you're still going to get a product that has two methyls that are identical. So we wind up with in this poor computer. Turns out when you make one giant TV screen and you put a tiny computer in it, it's not a very fast computer. <laughs> if the hydroxide pulls one of the green hydrogens off, we have two of them. So we still need to be worried about the anti periplanar issue, but at the same time, two hydrogens means we're gonna get both stereoisomers. So we don't need to be that worried about it because we can just look at the, stere the stereos of the products to figure out what's going to be more favored.
So out of the two, green, which one would be favored? Trans. We've got one here. When it comes to out of these four possibilities, picking what the major product is out of all four of them gets really tricky though, right? Because one, it doesn't specify whether there's heat or not. So if we just say, okay, let's, let's assume it's going to be 50-50, although let me go back to the West Virginia one because it's all a little bit of to some extent, solvent can affect things if you. Okay, so yeah, solvent. With hydroxide, less so. Because the, the solvent molecule is the conjugate acid of your nucleophile. So it's not going to affect it as much. Usually, in, and we see that with our choice of solvent for reactions, a lot of times we're using, like, we're using ethoxide as our nucleophile. We'll do the reaction in ethanol so that it doesn't really matter as much because if you deprotonate an ethanol molecule, then you leave another ethoxide in its place. Um, so that solvent effects really make the biggest difference with the chloride, bromide, niodide, and fluoride. And since those are more likely to be our leaving group than our nucleophile, it doesn't matter that much. We do still want to consider it, but it's not as big of a deal. Um, if we have, we have a strong nucleophile and strong base, nothing said about heat. So if we said, okay, well, Let's treat it like E1 and SN or E2 and SN2. It's going to be 50 50 either way. But then all three of these are going to be out of that 50% E2, right? And so if, you know, two thirds of the time, if this is our most, as which of these would we expect to be the major product of the E2? Is it going to go the green route or the blue route more likely? The Substitute. Blue is more substituted. Blue is the Zaitsev product. This is kind of a tricky one, though, because if you go the green route, you get increased resonance uh, because you wind up with a pi bond adjacent to a benzene ring. This is really the gray area where it'd be tricky. If, if we just said that all of these are equally, among these, we can at least decide, right? Just stereos. This one's more common than that one. Out of these two, we are normal. Well, when in doubt, we're with the general, right? So we say that's the major product, that's the mid product, that's the minor product of E2. But that's all out take. We're splitting all that up of 50% of the pie because 50% of it went SN2, 50% of it went E2. And of the 50%, maybe 80% went this way. But that's still 80% of 50% is only 40, right? Which means this might be our major product. Even though we have all these other rules for breaking these ones, if it's 50 50 SN2 or E2, and SN2 only one makes one product, it would, it would get tricky. I'm going to try to not ask a question like that on the test where it comes down to splitting hairs. I'm going to in general, what I'll do on the test is when you're predicting the mechanism, I'll, I'll have you pick a mechanism, just one mechanism. There'll be a sheet of like 10, 10 reactions. Um, so five reactions front, five reactions on the back. And you're just going to go through like what you're given. I predict this is the major mechanism. So you're not going to be dealing with competing reactions on most of them. You pick your mechanism and then you say, okay, if I said E2 was dominant because you guys said there was heat. If heat, heat favors elimination, so E2 is dominant, I'm going to ignore the fact that SN2 happens. And then out of these, I'm going to rank them major, mid, minor 
How did you determine that it was 50 50 between S2 and E2? Or because you you're going to get both of them happening under these conditions. And if we don't know anything about the heat, we don't know which way to, to split it. So you just kind of assume. Yeah. Right. So on the, let me just pull out the test so you can see what I'm, what I'm talking about here. So I have it set up so that there is going to be a, okay, don't worry about picking the mechanism, draw all everything, brute force one. It's going to, I'm going to try to make it, pick it so it's not hugely, like it's not going to be like 20 possible products, but there might be 10 possible products because if there's rearrangements, if there's this, if there's that, stereochemistry, all that. Um, but I won't have you pick between the mechanisms. And then there will be a few where I, don't give you what mechanism it is. I say just draw the mechanism. You have to use the information. Oh, that's a strong base, strong nucleophile, but I will give you the product. So for this one, we can look and say, okay, well, I know it's not SN2 or SN1 because it's an elimination product. It's an elimination product. Is it going to go E1 or E2? You have to kind of make that call, but I'm going to give you the product for it. And then you draw the arrows. And then the section three is going to be tell me what mechanism. And in general, if it's one where you need to be concerned about, is it going to go elimination versus substitution? Um, I'm going to either say with heat or in an ice bath. Ice bath means low temperature, so substitution. Heat means high temperature, so elimination. So that's not going to be enough to, to differentiate between first order, second order, but that at least, then you can just pick one of uh, elimination versus substitution. Does that make sense? And then section four is going to be the same product or the same reactions um, where you just then, based on what you put on page three, draw the products that would go with that and rank them. Um, what I will say also is, hopefully everybody knows at this point, I try not to take away points twice for the same mistake. If you get the mechanism wrong, um, but then you draw the correct product for the mechanism you picked, I'm only gonna mark you down on page three, not on page four. If you said E2, but it should have been SN2, but then you draw the products for E2 properly, I'll mark you down because you picked the wrong mechanism, but I won't mark you down for getting the right products with the mechanism you chose. So just try to be consistent. Whatever you say for page three, stick with that when it comes to drawing your products on page four. It never sat right that somebody, if you have these big multi-part questions where if you got part A wrong on a dumb mistake, that you could be penalized for every part of the question. So um, I try not to do that. If you get part A wrong, I would, but then you're internally consistent, then I'll only mark you down once. That said, if you if you get part A wrong, you got three A wrong, and then you went back and you got the the products for the correct mechanism, but it's inconsistent with what you wrote down, I'm gonna mark you down twice, even if it's the right answer for four. But if it's not consistent with what you put for three. Then I'm going to mark you down. Okay, so consistency, internal consistency with your own logic, is is what I'm looking for. And then part five, draw qualitatively what an NMR spectrum would look like for a simple compound. So how many signals roughly where are, just get them. I'm not looking for numbers necessarily on the chemical shift. I'm just looking for, you know, this peak is furthest to the left. This peak is in the middle. This peak is furthest to the right. Get the order of them correct. And if you're, you know, if they had a benzene ring and you, and you know, this is going to be somewhere between six and eight and you, you know, even better. But 
uh, in general, just really qualitatively, how many signals, what's the splitting look like, what's the integration look like, where are the beeps for a simple molecule. And then the wild card portion is going to be a, here's an IR and here's an NMR. Which of these compounds is it? So kind of like what you're doing, except I'm, I'm giving you your possibilities instead of making you come up with them from the, from the molecular formula. Right? And I'm giving you, I will give you this table <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to give you obviously the IR and um, I don't have the NMR on here because in general you just look at it in terms of the, the, the chemical shift other than the, the benzene ring it's not that critical really right you're just looking at, at electron density so rather than give you stuff you don't need that might just confuse you more what I did is just not deal with the NMR, not put the NMR frequencies on there because you just have to look at where the electron withdrawn groups are, where the electronegative elements are to put them in order. Um, but that's, this would be a lot to memorize. So I'm not gonna have you memorize that. All right. Four minutes left. Um, I put some flow charts in here for how you can decide between first order, second order. Um, like I said, you, there's a lot of ways you could do this. You could split it up first into is it elimination or substitution, and then decide first order, second order. For me, the way I think splitting it up is it first order or second order makes more sense first because that's mostly based on just where is your leaving group. But in general, strong bases. High concentrations, nonpolar solvents, nonpolar aprotic solvents. Um, it's going to favor second order, weak bases, low concentration. When I say weak bases, I also mean nucleophiles. Um, lower concentrations, protic solvents are typically going to favor uh, first order reactions. And then within that, if you have a strong nucleophile, it's usually small, right? Strong nucleophiles have a negative charge usually, and they're tiny. So that, and if they have access to the alpha carbon, if they can get to the alpha carbon, you usually see substitution. If it's a bulkier base or your high temperatures, then you're a lot more likely to see elimination. Right, so this is just more of the same, same information we've been talking about, just more ways of organizing it. And then I think it's mostly from here. I don't know why this is all screwed as well. Um, and I need to redo these slides a little bit because I was I had the, the solvents broken on this polar versus non-polar one really should be protic versus aprotic. Aprotic solvents favor um, second order reactions. Protic solvents favor first order reactions. And so just lots of practice in here. And we can go through these and review on Thursday if you want, if you like. Um, also, and I will also say um, we. Typically, we don't meet for lab during finals week, but the way that we have these course, we're kind of going towards, a, I think it's a more modern and more universal style where the lab is a separate course for this. You can probably notice when you registered, right? Um, that means we actually do have a final exam time slot for the lab. Would that'll just be more time you can come into the lab to work on stuff, ask questions, use it as review office hours, that kind of thing as well next Tuesday afternoon, I believe. Um, so you have that time as well to ask questions um, and, and work on your, on your lab write-up.
All right, and we won't get into synthesis this quarter. Start synthesis is basically just the idea that um, knowing the mechanisms that we have, how do we get to a specific target? So it's basically just working backwards. Um, and that's takes a lot of practice and it gets more powerful the more mechanisms we know. So when we add more mechanisms, we'll spend more time with synthesis next quarter. So you're like using the mechanisms to reach a target? Right, exactly. If I want to make, it also works better once we bring in addition reactions because you can't really get to this product without making a pi bond and then breaking the pi bond. And we haven't covered addition reactions yet. So this, this slide is actually out of place. So ignore that. All right. Um, so in lab today, uh, it's going to be another steam distillation, just this time with an unknown. You can start from following the same procedure you've had that we use for the steam distillation in the past. Um, and then but you're gonna, it's not gonna be clover lemon. It's going to be a random spice that I'm going to assign to you. Everybody's gonna have their own. And there might be certain things that are a little bit different. You might change the procedure a little bit um, based on what spice you're given. Is it, you know, do you have to use mortar and pestle? Or are you gonna get out a knife and like dice it? How are you gonna grind it up? Does that create other issues? Like for instance, um, in the past, we've had issues with cinnamon. I think I mentioned this cinnamon. When you do this with cinnamon, it foams up like crazy when it starts to boil. That's really only an issue with certain spices that have certain textures on the um, on the surface. So if you get one of those, you might have to change that and make an adjustment in your procedure. But for now, you can start from the same procedure we've done before. And then you're just going to write it up yourself in your own words as much as you can. There's only so much you can do to rewrite really simple factual statements, right? I, I'm aware of that. Um, but don't copy and paste, obviously. Um, but that's gonna be your final. It's gonna be like, okay, now do a steam distillation on your own and write it up. And here's the spectra for what you got. Analyze the spectra, what's the structure, okay? All right, then I'll see everybody at one. Okay.